having spent about 17 years in my corporate career back in the 80s and 90s and working with numerous gurus, consultancies, suppliers, business schools around uh, negotiation, I quickly came to conclude that there were many, many, many philosophies being advocated as being the right way to negotiate deals, to negotiate contracts, to negotiate relationships. And um, increasingly, I became, uh, shall we say, confused around, so which is the appropriate way that I should be recommending to my employers for the purpose of supporting all of our corporate buyers from around the world? And it prompted me to examine and study um, the different ways of negotiating and how, in fact, there are no good or bad or right or wrong ways to negotiate. There's an appropriate way. And that appropriateness depends on your circumstances. And what I set out to do over the following years was to develop a philosophy that allowed people to understand more about themselves, more about the situations that they face, and then adopt the appropriate approach to each of their negotiations rather than simply competing or looking to win or allowing a lot of other psychological challenges to uh, prevent them from optimising their agreements. So how did you get into it? Was this, were, are you from a sales background or was it more of a psychology and the way people work background? What's your story? Well, I was responsible for commercial development within within the training and development uh, area. But so, so, so my job was to understand the commercial challenges. At the time, my, my last uh, corporate job was in Kingfisher, and Kingfisher at the time was a whole range of uh, retailers, including B&Q, uh, in the days of Woolworths, Comet, Superdrug, and, uh, and many others. So my, my, my job and challenge was to identify what the appropriate solution was for the business as it set out to buy uh, from all around the world. But before that, I was at Coca-Cola and responsible there for commercial development for the account managers and salesmen and the way in which they set about agreeing terms with multiple retailers from around the world. So I've seen both buying and selling sides of it. But of course, over the last 25 years of the Gap Partnership, we've worked across every single business sector around the world in, I think, 60 countries. So we've had a lot of exposure um, from banking to oil industry through to consumer um, technology. Um, so it takes you to a lot of different places, and especially geographically and culturally. So in a nutshell, would you say then it's about getting the best deal, whether that be in relationships or whether that be in finances, whether that be in a sales negotiation. It's about getting the best you can from the deal that's on the table. Yes, it is about getting the best possible deal. And and that can mean different things Mm. because you've got things like relativity. Because Some people perceive the best deal to be better than last time or better than what I was um, offered earlier. And getting the best deal can mean many, many things. For example, it, it can be a broad range of different value elements. Things like convenience and speed and reliability um, can be more important than simply price. So it's understanding what is a good deal here. Is it one that carries lower risk or is it one that is simply focused on the price? A lot of people are challenged with their their egos and their, their need to win on a deal and subsequently can compromise the value of the deals they negotiate simply by being too focused on one issue. You must have dealt with some big egos over the years then in all the companies you've worked for. Um, I most certainly <laughs> had. I remember back in 2000, I think it was 2007, I was working with uh, the managing directors of what was then Lehman Brothers in New York, mm-hmm. in Wall Street. And, um, you know, they were a pretty interesting uh, group of people. Fortunately, I was 10 years into the Gap Partnership by then. So my experience um, held me in good stead because, uh, as you say, that, that there's some people there who really genuinely believe that they know better. But, I mean, part of our, our philosophy at the Gap Partnership is it, very real. It's based on a whole bunch of what I call truisms. Um, They just are. That is just how psychology works. It's how commerce works. It's how people work. It's equally as applicable, of course, to personal relationships as it is to commercial deals. But the edgier, direct side of of, of our brand that confronts uh, reality um, rather than uh, leaving people places to hide is um, quite unique in that our job is to help people to to change in a way they want to, to, not to let them off the hook easily. Over the last six years, there's been a significant acceleration of change. And I sat down with Wiley, the publisher, and, and agreed that the context of the book does need modernising. We need to reflect the challenges that everyday people today are facing. So, you know, for example, most things that we experience today were around six years ago, but the, the impact they've had on society 
uh, on assumptions, on values, on views has accelerated tremendously. So if you look at, for example, social media uh, as one example of throughout the pandemic, the growth of influencers that, that serves to um, inform so many marketing campaigns today simply wasn't so so evident uh, six years ago. You look at technology and subscription-based models that, that, that companies adopt now for almost all things that mm. you can buy, uh, ease and convenience, again, has accelerated, as has communication. Uh, Teams, Zoom, remote working, uh, all influenced relationships and the way in which people interact and communicate with each other. It's so, almost like uh, a social uh, history then, isn't it? If you look at like your original edition to now, you can see rapidly how life has changed, how the world has changed in a lot of ways. Life has. Yeah. And, and, you know, assumptions have changed, mm -hmm. um, attitudes towards risk, fear of uncertainty. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the economy today, with, you know, interest rates, the knock-on effect of the pandemic, um, attitudes around sustainability, um, equality, diversity are all, all part of the mix of, around how relationships work, what's important, what gets included in agreements and deals to protect um, corporate identities. Or it may simply be, I've got a view on this, and this is really important to me, and I'm prepared to trade off something for it. And, and the extent to which the types of what we call variables, you know, issues within the negotiation feature, have changed over the last uh, last six years. So the third edition, which has uh, just, just come out, provides greater context. Um, I put two more new chapters into the book, which I think are fundamental to change. Well, one is around time and how time is valued differently today as a result of the changes of the last six years. Um, and one is around virtual communication, which uh, which is so much more prevalent today. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's sometimes even even as simple as send a, an email or, or a text, you know, that you can't often see the nuances. You can't see if there's humour in an email or a text. You know, there's, there's difficulties there on a very basic well, level. Also, and also it's on the record because it's there as a reference to go back to. So mm -hmm. you've got to be very careful about what you put down, even if you're simply exploring possibilities. But then, of course, uh, for a lot of organisations where there are changes, for example, I've, you know, you're dealing with, with, with a buyer, uh, the, the buyer's decided to move jobs, you're introduced to a new buyer, and you're starting that relationship from scratch virtually very often as opposed to face to face uh, there's no opportunity to break bread have a coffee together uh, spend an hour or two talking things through online things are much more uh, here's the agenda they're more transactional and therefore what you see is, is the scope for erosion in client to client uh, relationships principally through the fact that, that, that you, you haven't got that physical time together that, that people underestimate is, is very important to human beings. So what do you do then? Because that is people will be listening now and thinking, absolutely, you know, you meet people you're going to be working with for the first time. And for a lot of young people, they've gone into the workplace and they've never actually met the people that they're now working with. They're all working remotely. So how can you form those relationships when that vital part's missing? Well, yeah, I mean, it's obviously very challenging. And, and, and the thing is, it directly affects things like trust and respect and you know as i said earlier it, it boils down to communication becoming very transactional and agreements becoming very transactional so you, you know one needs to go in uh, with a view to i have to meet with these people at some point and we need to agree that we're going to spend some time together to understand each other i mean it depends on on the deals and and, and the levels that are involved but the physicality has to be almost a critical part of engaging and becoming bought in to, to what you're involved mm. in. Um, otherwise, all sorts of risks. Even if you're not working in, in big business, we negotiate more than what we think on our general day-to-day -day life. Absolutely, absolutely. And planning for those negotiations, again, the discipline around planning where it is remote, even, even as you say, uh, on an everyday level, where there's, there's a possibility there to produce a, a deal which is a different shape, which actually is more beneficial to all concerned. Um, and making the time to do that, have been motivated enough to do that, is more challenging when you don't have that personal obligation, that personal relationship. It, it really is you're just dealing with a name. 
So, yeah, I, I, I see that as being in one of today's big challenges. What makes somebody a successful negotiator? Because right now we might have somebody listening who needs to sort out a contract or they might need to sort out a, an energy bill or a change in family life. And let's face it, sometimes when I've had my kids, you know, when they were little, I felt like I was working for the UN at times, Steve, trying to negotiate different things because, you know, when they're small and everything's kicking off. So, you know, we, we all have have negotiations to deal with so what would your top tips be well i mean the, the first one is an easy thing to say but it's something i focus on a lot in the book is self-awareness being aware of, of what you're trying to achieve and um, from that perspective your ability to listen understand and get inside the head of other people those you're negotiating with understand why they're feeling the way they're feeling why they are uh, taking up the position that they're taking up and, and investing time in understanding that if you negotiate from inside your own head you're in a very dangerous place the place to be is inside their head understand what their priorities are their interests you know their, their deadlines anything you can about them first and foremostly um, and, and then adapting it as appropriate rather than competing. Look at it. Is, is, there, is there a problem to be solved here? Is there a solution here that, that they're more likely to um, accommodate? So it really is a sense of being in touch with yourself. Don't, don't, don't get stressed out by a conflict or perceived conflict around rejection. Just see it as a process. You know, negotiation is a process. It will involve no's as well as yeses or maybes. It can be frustrating. You do need patience, but in investing in the time necessary, the value is there. The more time you spend on a negotiation, the more value you're likely to identify with and does have the power to change the course of our lives.